Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here with all of you today. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pascha Tideshi Tarine Vancha Kalpataru Bhescha Krupas in Dubevacha Patita Nam Pavanibhya Vaishnavibhya Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasa the Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna So today we are discussing the fourth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam chapter 13 and this is a description of the descendants of Dhruva Maharaj. But the fourth canto is one of the most fascinating cantos in the Bhagavatam. And I'll do a quick recap of where we are coming from. So this is in the transition of two major pastimes in the Bhagavatam. Probably one of the most quoted pastimes from the Srimad Bhagavatam is the pastime of Dhruva Maharaj. And that has ended about a chapter ago. That's as you see from chapter 8 till chapter 12, it's gone on. And if we consider history of the world, we consider even the history of illustrious dynasties. There are various levels of people who appear over there. So Dhruva Maharaj was an exceptional person. He was exceptional even in an exceptional dynasty. And after some time now, Prutu will appear. And Prutu Maharaj is also going to be an extraordinary king. So in between, <coughs> there are many generations who appear. And those are described in chapter 13. So in chapter 13, broadly speaking, what happens is that from Dhruva Maharaj, many, many generations are described. And then something counterintuitive, something unexpected happens. And that is... That while this is a very illustrious dynasty, but within that, a very heinous character appears. And that is the King Vena. So there is his father Anga, who is virtuous. He, but unfortunately, and he strives very hard to have a successor, an heir. And he gets that heir, but unfortunately, that heir turns out to be not at all what his father had dreamt him to be. He turns out to be a monster even as a child. And the reaction to the monstrous activities of his child. Now, sometimes when a child is called a little monster, that just means it's a fun way of saying that the child is mischievous, the child is having high energy, the child does something disruptive things. But here, to refer to Vena as a monster, was not just an endearing way of calling out mischief. He was actually monstrous even as a child. And you come till verse 35. So this is, we've discussed till 35. So we'll start from 36. Am I right, Prem Sindhu Prabhu? Yes, Prabhu. Okay. So the way I'll go over it is, I will quickly go through some of the verses and I will elaborate on them. And at any time, if there are any reflections or questions, feel free to ask. Hmm. So here, what happens is, King Vena is performing a great sac sacrifice to get a son. So he has performed a sacrifice and from that, the sma, the purusha, uttashtu, he mamalya malambaraha, hiranmayena patrena siddham adaya payasam. So from that sacrifice appears a effulgent being carrying a golden pot. Hiranmayana patrena. A golden 
ഗോൾഡൻ ഗാർലൻഡ് ഗോൾഡൻ വൈറ്റ് ഡ്രസ് സിദ്ധം ആദായ പായസം പായസം ഈസ് ദ മിസ്റ്റിക്കൽ പ്രിപ്പറേഷൻ ദാറ്റ് വിൽ എൻഷ്യൂർ ദ കിങ് ഹാസ് എ സക്സസർ ദിസ് വിൽ ബി ടേക്കൻ ബൈ ദ ക്വീൻ ആൻഡ് ദർ ആഫ്റ്റർ ഷി വിൽ ബിക്കം പ്രഗ്നെന്റ് so this is describing over here now these fire sacrifices that are described in the vedic texts they are actually a combination of religious as well as technological activity there is prayer there is worship there is chanting of holy names it's in that sense religion but it's also technology in the sense that it is a means to gain power over things over which we normally humans don't have power so just as in today's world if somebody wants to have a child and they're not able to have a child today we may use various forms of technology there may be various ways of artificial uh, trying to get a child so here this is also in one sense we could call it art it is not exactly artificial in the modern sense but it is an attempt ultimately technology is what it is an attempt to gain power where we normally don't have power and that's not necessarily a bad thing right now we are having this class so there is a geographical distance which we can't immediately transcend so we are using technology to transcend the distance so the king gave the paisam to his child to his wife and then she had a child and then when the child was born what happened was that this child there the two three things we will discuss but let's look at his activities first as i said why is he called a monster so shara sanam udyamya മൃഗയുർവനഗോചര ഹന്ത്യ അസാധുർ മൃഗാൻ ദീനാൻ വേണോ അസാവിത്യ അറൗ ജന സോ സ ഷാരസാനാം സോ ഷാരസ ഇസ് വിത്ത് എ ബോ ആൻഡ് ആരോ ദിസ് ചൈൽഡ് ഹി വാസ് സ്കിൽഡ് ഹി വാസ് സ്കിൽഡ് എഡ് ആർച്ചറി ബട്ട് വാട്ട് ഹാപ്പൻസ് ഇസ് ദർ ഇസ് ദർ ആർ സ്കിൽസ് ആർ ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് ബട്ട് വാല്യൂസ് ആർ ഇവൻ മോർ ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് and if somebody has the skill to shoot but does not have the right values to know whom to shoot that can be extremely dangerous mruga yurvana gochara he would go into the forest and indiscriminately kill animals just for the sake of pleasure so just like nowadays especially in america uh, when people easily have access to guns what the problem comes is that okay you may know how to shoot but if you don't know I had a discretion about when to shoot that could lead to a lot of problems so veno asa vitya raujana so people in fear whenever this child would go they would say oh, this is vena coming vena coming he may he may attack us he may threaten us he may kill us let's run away from here so that is not the kind of impression a uh, uh, we would want from somebody who is going to be the future king and not only that what is described over here is ആ ക്രീഡേ ക്രീഡത്തോ ബാലാൻ വയസാൻ അതിദാരുണ പ്രസഹയ്യ നിരണോ ക്രോശ പശുമാരം അമാറയത് സോ ഡിസ്ക്രൈബ് ഓവർ ഹിയർ വാട്ട് ഹാപ്പൻസ് ഇസ് ദാറ്റ് ആ ക്രീഡേ ക്രീഡത്തോ ബാലാൻ വൈൽ യു ജസ്റ്റ് പ്ലേയിങ് വാട്ട് വുഡ് ഇതു ക്രീഡത്തോ ജസ്റ്റ് ഫൈ പ്ലേയിങ് കാജ്വൽ വിത്ത് അതർ ചിൽഡ്രൻ വയസ്യാൻ അതിദാരുണ ദേ വിർ ഓഫ് ഹിസ് ഓൺ ഏജ് വയസ്യാൻ അതിദാരുണ ബട്ട് ഇസ് ക്രൂവൽ പ്രസഹയ്യ നിരണു ക്രോശ ഹി വുഡ് ബൈ ഫോർസ് മെർസിലസ്ലി പശുമാരം ആമാറയത് ജസ്റ്റ് ആസ് വൺ മൈറ്റ് കിൽ എൻ ആനിമൽ ഹി വുഡ് കിൽ എ ചൈൽഡ് വാട്ട് കൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് ചൈൽഡ് വുഡ് ഡു സംതിങ് ലൈക്ക് ദാറ്റ് സോ ഇൻ ടുഡേസ് ടെർമിനോളജി വി സേ ഹി ആഡ് ഹി ആഡ് സിവിയർ ആംഗർ മാനേജ്മെന്റ് ഇഷ്യൂസ് കിഡ്സ് പ്ലേ അറ്റ് ദാറ്റ് ടൈം സംടൈംസ് വി ലൂസ് സംടൈംസ് എ ചൈൽഡ് ലൂസസ് then have to have a sporting spirit okay some it's a game sometimes we lose sometimes we win but he was such a child see that he when he would get angry he just was not at all a sporting body person he would get enraged just beat others and beat others to death so it is one thing to kill animals that's bad even animal killing is horrible but it's another to kill children and he was a child and he was killing children now we may say think over here uh, this is a sacred book and we read the bhagavatam to be edified so why are even such characters mentioned over here mm-hmm. 
So the point is, the Bhagavatam is depicting reality as it is in the world. And one of the biggest theological questions that almost everyone has is why bad things happen to good people. So the Bhagavatam, in one sense, rephrases the question. Rather than, rather than the question, why bad things happen to good people, the Bhagavatam's question is, when bad things happen to good people, what do good people do? What do good people do? Because in one sense, the world is a place where bad things will happen to everyone. It is not a matter of if, it is just a matter of when. The Bhagavad Gita Krishna says that even those who are purely devoted to him, Satatam Kirta Yantomam Yatantasya Drudavrataha He says even those who are purely devoted to him, those who have no aspiration other than to serve him, he says even they have to endeavor very greatly. Why? Because life in the world is not easy for anyone. So, so there is any way difficulty in the world which comes of its own natural accord. And that is made much more difficult if there are people out to make it worse. There is one kind of misery which just comes out of nature. Sometimes there is a thunderstorm, sometimes there is a tsunami, sometimes there is an earthquake. So, or sometimes we may say there is a pandemic. Now, these are some things which come on their own. Now, when they come on their own, what, what, there is very little we can do about it. And it is bad enough. But what is especially difficult to bear is, not just natural calamities coming on their own, but somebody causing suffering. Somebody causing suffering. And not just causing suffering, but causing suffering for no reason. It's as I said, suffering is just a is this a part of life. We can't avoid it. But one of the teachings, essential teachings of the great spiritual traditions of the world is that the sufferings we go through are not pointless. That the universe moves purposefully. And the sufferings that we are going through, even if we are not able to understand right now why these sufferings are happening, but they still have a point, they have a purpose. And in this sense, it's important to differentiate between the causes, the cause of suffering and the purpose of suffering. This is a key theme in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. When Bhishma is discussing the nature of suffering, and he says that the causes of suffering can be many, and sometimes they are very, very difficult to even discern. Mm -hmm. So that means, suppose somebody gets a disease. Now, why does one person get a disease and another person not get the disease? It's it's difficult. We may say, okay, you go, you this person had poor immunity, but then that person had maybe good immunity. And still they got a disease. So causes refer to, see, if I am here, cause refers to where the suffering comes from. And that is very difficult to determine. As we are living in a world where there is a lot of uh, information overload, there is a significant erosion in the sources of, inf in the, in, so significant erosion, erosion in trust in the sources of information, whether it is mainstream media, whether it is even the government, whether it is um, even experts. So what happens is, when some problem is coming, what exactly is the cause of the problem? That's very difficult to determine. So of course, we have to use our intelligence as much as possible to try to understand the cause of the problem. But sometimes it's not possible. We just can't figure it out. So we focus less on the cause of the problem than the purpose of the problem. So cause, if I am here, cause means where the problem is coming from. Purpose means where the problem is meant to take me. 
I repeat this difference. Cause means where the problem is coming from. Purpose is where the problem is meant to take me. And the difference is that we, it is not very easy for us to know what the cause of problems is. However, the purpose of all problems ultimately is the same as the purpose of the world itself. And the purpose is to further our spiritual journey, to accelerate, to stimulate and accelerate our spiritual evolution, to inspire us to turn toward Krishna and to become more devoted to him. So this is what we will see happening in this particular narrative. That Anga, he has a son who is extraordinarily heinous. Now we may, if somebody's son were acting in this particular way, we would expect the law to intervene. You know, the police would come in. But if it's the king's son, well, who's going to intervene? Maybe the king should be intervening. But the problem here was, he was the only son. And the king needed that son as heir. Now, we may say, is such a person even qualified to be a, becoming a, be a successor? A few things could be worse than having uh, a terrible, a tyrannical person in power. Hmm. Sometimes some people say that I don't care about politics. Well, fine enough. We don't want to be political and backbiting. Now, we may not care about politics, but political politics cares about us. And not in a positive sense. That means, you know, what happens in politics affects us. That I'm not saying that we need to be obsessed with political happenings and constantly be worried or agitated by that. But the point I'm making is, that the way the world is ruled and whoever is ruling it, that makes a big difference. Sometimes you may say that, or whether this person is going to rule or that person is going to rule, it makes no difference. Ultimately, anybody who is godless, they're all self-seeking and they're all opportunistic. And yes, that is true at one level. However, it is true only at one level. Bhaktivinoda Thakur in his Chaitanya Shikshamrit is very cautious or very, you could say, very clear in cautioning us to not conflate all the three modes. He says there is Sattva, there is Rajas and there is Tamas. There is goodness, passion and ignorance. And he says that generally spiritualists appreciate the value of goodness. Bhaktas want to go beyond goodness but we at least appreciate the value of goodness. But in valuing goodness, sometimes we lump passion and ignorance together. Both of them are bad. And yes, in one sense they are bad, in the sense that we all want to go beyond this. The Bhagavatam says, Tada Rajas Tamo Bhava Kama Lobhada Yeshchaye that go beyond passion and ignorance by hearing the Bhagavatam. And yes, in that sense, that we want to go beyond the modes of passion and ignorance, both of them are similar. At the same time, in terms of functioning in the world, there is a huge difference between passion and ignorance. If there is a, for example, consider a family. If the parents in the family are in the mode of passion, then they may be themselves very ambitious. They may put a lot of pressure on their children. And you have to work, you have to study, you have to achieve this, you have to pass this exam, you have to get this many marks. And in one sense, the children may feel, oh, you know, this is, this is bad. Okay, yeah, that may not be the best for spiritual life. That may not even be the best for their sustainable growth in life. But in many ways, parents in passion in Rajoguna may be a thousand times better than parents in the mode of ignorance. If somebody has had a child and they're just doing drugs and they don't care for the child, most of the time they're stoned. They don't even hold a job. And the child has to... Somehow, the child has to become like a parent and take care of the parents. Then that kind of life is terrible. So he says that Rajas, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that Rajas, mode of passion, can often be a necessary antidote to the severe toxicity of 
the mode of ignorance so the mode of ignorance is far worse than the mode of passion so why i'm talking about this is that i was talking about politics we say i don't care about politics all kings are the same all heads of state are the same well yes how in one sense it is true but if there is a head of state in the mode of ignorance that is far worse than a head of state in the mode of passion that of a person with a head of state in the mode of passion may want to get fame and get power and get wealth but as it is said that you know when the when the tide rises some waves may rise very high but the tide also everything rises when the tide comes so some heads of state when the mode of passion they may want fame but they may want fame by making their country powerful by making their country or their state or their constituents uh, prosperous or whatever and at least materially that might be good but somebody who is in the mode of ignorance they their pleasure comes at the cost of others pain they cause pain to others and that is dangerous that is where there are tyrannical kings there are many places where heads of state may actually do activities which uh, can be enormously of distressing devastating for their kingdoms so we know a war is terrible terrible war is happening in ukraine now uh, while that is very much in the news you know there have been similar if not far worse wars that have been happened in recent historical memory although they may not be in our memory much what happened many things happened in the middle east so now the point is if a person is in the mode of ignorance they will delight in causing pain to others so what is happening is that here king vena or vena is a prince he is going to become the king and he th- he is already exhibiting characteristics of tamas now tamas the mode of ignorance sometimes we think that the mode of ignorance means a person is lazy and passive and and just incompetent inactive well well if that person is in the mode of ignorance like that it's it's good in one sense at least they are not doing harm to others but one of the character one of the char- it's it's paradoxical that the mode of ignorance has two characteristics one is inactivity and the other is destructiveness anger which is rises from the degeneration of frustrated desire is also said to be in the mode of ignorance so somebody in tamas may be inactive well maybe they are not fulfilling their potential maybe they are hurting their body they just sit all day maybe just play video games watch tv surf the net and just gulp down food now they sit on they sit on couches eating potatoes and then they become like a potato they we say they are wasting their life but they are not harming others much but there is another kind of toxicity in the mode of ignorance when somebody is ignorant in the in tamas but they are destructive so such person may have energy such persons may also have to some extent ability but their ability is directed for a destructive purpose so sometimes sometimes we think of the mode of ignorance as the opposite of knowledge as the opposite of intelligence and yes in one sense it is true but krishna in the bhagavad gita in 18th chapter talks about knowledge in the mode of ignorance and he also talks about intelligence in the mode of ignorance so what does this mean knowledge in the mode of ignorance and intelligence in the mode of ignorance i think are a knowledge and intelligence opposite to intel- to ignorance well yes and no what it means is that when somebody is in the mode of ignorance whatever knowledge they have they use it for a ignorant purpose so knowledge in the mode of ignorance means the person acquires knowledge in such a way that it does not remove their ignorance it only reinforces their ignorance like somebody may say you know i am very open minded feel free to express your mind as long as you agree with me <laughs> now what kind of opening of mind is that so if somebody says that you know yes 
you know whatever information you give me feel free to give any information you want but the information shouldn't displease me the information shouldn't disagree with what my world view is and what will happen is they're getting more and more information but they are only reinforcing their preconceptions and when that happens the person can't grow so they have knowledge but they have knowledge that is only about a small pocket of reality yat tukrutsnavade ekasmin karye saktam ahetukam atatvartav dalpam cha tatvama samudharitam krishna says in the bhagavad gita 1822 that such people they have knowledge about one small thing in rea- about, about reality and they equate it with all of reality and they keep getting reinforcing their own misconceptions and that is how biases and prejudices happen see essentially when there are biases and prejudices nowadays there is a lot of concern for social justice of course every good cause in this world sooner or later becomes politicalized and then it is misused misappropriated by political agents but what happens is how do biases and prejudices arise they arise some people have some negative experiences with someone and they ex- make a huge extrapolation from a tiny sample you know this person from this community this religion this country this particular ethnicity they behave rudely with me and therefore this whole community is rude so that is what knowledge in the mode of ignorance and once that happens if a person gets a preconception then even when they surf the news even if they read even if they do research they will only look for the information which will reinforce their conceptions like that so that is knowledge in the mode of ignorance so why am i talking about this see vena was not incompetent he was he was powerful he was skilled and say so if he is playing with kids of his own age and if he can beat them to death that means he is much more powerful than kids of his own age if as a child as a kid is going out to the forest and killing animals with a bow and arrow a bow and arrow is not a automatic gun it is not a nuclear weapon the animals are dangerous if he is able to kill them he is powerful he, he has skills so he has skill he has physical power he has physical ability but unfortunately all of this is misused because of his character which is cruelty because of his cruelty so seeing this the king is in a bind and he just doesn't know what to do so he comes up with a curious decision we can say when i first read this past time i found it very difficult to digest what the king did and i'll come to the king's decision uh, in a few minutes but at this point does anyone have any comments or questions on what we have discussed till now Uh, <clears throat> this is chambavati in uh, hari krishna hari krishna thank you so much um this is such a timely topic especially with everything as you mentioned that's going on in ukraine and talking about yes. the decisions that um you know heads of states are making and there's this one question that i have um and you will not be the first person that I will ask this question of but i'm just wondering given the opportunity theoretically if you were to have an opportunity to speak directly to mr putin what would you share with him in terms of you know our philosophy and and what he's doing Okay. There are two things over here. This is a, as I said, it's a. Our philosophy is basically like we could say it's like a toolkit. And what tools we draw from it depends on multiple factors. First is, first is how much, how well we know the toolkit, how well we can use the which tools we can use from the toolkit, and thirdly, uh, what is the need of the other person. so 
I would, in my small understanding, that aggression and insecurity are two sides of the same coin. So when somebody is, so I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm explaining what I would say, and then I'll tell what I would say, basically. So yes. I, I don't think there is any one answer, because a lot would depend, in, especially when we're going to speak, a lot depends on relationships, now, that, the particular equation that you have with the person. So in general, if we don't know anyone like that, if we have no relationship, and we just have opportunity to talk. So the basic, uh, from our philosophy's perspective, ultimately, uh, everything that we are doing, you know, every, every activity is, act, is actually a distorted expression of the soul's longing for Krishna. Now, some act, in the activity, the mode of goodness are relatively less distorted. Those in passion are more distorted. And those in ignorance are highly distorted. But ultimately, everybody is longing to love and be loved. And when there is insecurity, now insecurity is not just, okay, my body will be destroyed, but it's actually my existence. Does it even count? See, there is circumstantial insecurity where, okay, you know, uh, if I lose my job, what will happen? If I can't pay for my, the mortgage for my house, what will happen? Things like that. That's, ex that's circumstantial. But existential insecurity is, does my existence even count? That is a much, much more deep rooted insecurity. So, in general, whenever there is aggression, in, whenever there's aggression, when there is heavy aggression, that is a result of heavy insecurity. So, unless that insecurity is addressed in some way, the only way to stop aggression is by further aggression. And sometimes that is required. So just like we see in the Mahabharata, even Krishna went as a Shanti Dut to, to Duryodhan. And Krishna offered a peace on the most accommodating terms. But Duryodhan rejected it all. Now Duryodhan, what did he say? See, actually, if you consider that context, Krishna's going as the peace, on, peace messenger is extraordinary. Krishna is the most powerful person he, at that time. Even those who didn't accept him as God, they accepted that he was extremely powerful. He had neutralized some of the most powerful demons of the, that time. So Krishna going itself is an extraordinary gesture. Normally, if there are peace talks, somebody, the secretary of state goes, somebody, the military commander or some, some subordinate goes. Imagine if there is a peace talks and the president of America personally goes to Russia to talk. That means they're taking the peace proposal very, very seriously. So when Krishna went there to Duryodhana, and what was Duryodhana's reply? He said, I will not give you enough land to even put the tip of a needle through. So, now what is happening over here? See, there are different ways of saying no. That so, Sometimes we say, suppose we invite somebody to come for a program and say, no, you know, I got to do this or because of this I can't come. Now, imagine if we invite somebody for a program and they say, even if I die, my dead body will never come for your program. <laughs> so, what are they doing? They're not just saying no to the invitation. They are like kicking the, they are stamping the door, the thudding the door close on the face of the person. It's a no to the person itself. So, the point I'm making is that even our scriptures are not uh, utopian. That in some cases, with some people, even God himself may not be able to bring about peace. So if somebody's insecurity is so deep-rooted that their aggression is so huge, then sometimes counter-aggression is the only way. Mm -hmm. Having said that, my understanding is that we have to find out in general what is outreach. The outreach is find out if this is the person's circle of interest or person's circle of need. And this is the ambit of Krishna consciousness. Where do the two intersect? So, depending on the person's understanding, if their need is insecurity, then how does how might security come? That if the person's concern is what will be my legacy? You know, what will people know me by? What will my country know me by? What will the world will know me by? Then that could be a dimension by which we could bring in some spirituality over there. 
that actually our legacy is not just how the world remembers us, but our legacy is determined by where we go. We are eternal beings. And our legacy is not just for the world to carry. Our legacy is also what we carry with us in our future lives. So, so bringing the idea of a soul can be a basis of security for some people. But in general, uh, I don't have a specific answer. But the principle I would say is that depending on the mood of the, see Prabhupada, uh, why I'm, I might seem to be evasive, but it's not a matter of being, there's no pat answer for serious problems. I'm, saying, I'm talking the principle that Prabhupada came from America to meet Indira Gandhi. And he cut short his American tour. Indira Gandhi was at that time the Prime Minister of India. And at that time, uh, the, the Premier of Bangladesh had just been assassinated with his entire family. And at that time, uh, the suspicion was that, that Indira Gandhi was the fear the widespread uh, notion was that Indira Gandhi was next on the hit list of the terrorists, that she would be killed. And she had gone along with the meeting just as a courtesy. So Prabhupada could see immediately her mind was not there. Now we might say that actually, you know, isn't that an ideal opportunity? And somebody who has, a head of state has a threat of assassination on their head. And at that time, that means they are very, they are, they, they are close to that. Isn't that the time when you could speak philosophy? And isn't that the time when you could awaken people, awaken their head of state? But Prabhupada realized, Prabhupada had a, quite a plan what he would talk with her. But Prabhupada saw she was so distracted. And Prabhupada just politely talked with her a few words. To to re, uh, uh, and the meeting ended. So, we see that, uh, I'm making this point that sometimes we have this notion that Krishna consciousness means that you know, we just Krishna consciousness cannot be reduced to a uh, to a either a, to a few words of a pat formula. So even Krishna himself could not uh, get peace with Duryodhan, and Prabhupada is interacting with a head of state who had a death threat hanging on her head. Even Prabhupada couldn't at that time he realized this is not the right opportunity to probe into the heart of the person. So at that time, that person was not receptive. Although they were on the, although she, she was under threat. So actually, it a, a lot depends on that person's frame of mind at that time, that person's concept, that person's worldview, that person's uh, insecurities or emotional situation, emotional needs. And within that, somehow we have to bring in what will catch their interest. So it's, uh, it's, uh, I don't have any easy answer. It'll require, if that has to be done, if somebody is going to get an opportunity like that, then they have to carefully know the person. They have to, when, when Prabhupada came to America, he actually, at least in the first, first year or so, he studied American culture. He tried to understand how American people behave. And then he started his outreach. So it is a grave responsibility, a great opportunity if somebody had it. Somebody gets it. But my understanding would be that we'll need to study the person a lot, study the situation much more. And it's very rare that some transient, somebody can be, uh, somebody can automatically get some quick pat answer. Okay. Prabhu, thank you so very, very much. I, I think that what you just expressed is also a, um, just in our daily lives and interactions and uh, associating with others, even devotees, it's a, you just provided, at least for me, a uh, sort of a, a universal um, template of understanding, you know, the perceived <laughs> actions of perhaps, you know, aggression of, of uh, others. So thank you very much. Yes, bro. Yes, Mataji, thank you. So, okay. Are there any other reflections or comments? Thank you. Um, Hare Krishna. <laughs> um, my obeisance is uh, to all the assembled devotees and to you, uh, His Grace uh, Chaitanya Prabhu. Okay, my question is about uh, your description of knowledge in ignorance. Um, 
And you said that uh, when people do research and they already have their mind made up on something, they only look for what will reinforce their position or their yes. precon preconceived notion. I, I, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to see what is wrong with that because, uh, for instance, before I, I became a devotee, I already made up my mind about the Bible. Uh, if I found a new a group preaching something, I wanted to see what text, what book are they using. And once it is the Bible, I just don't bother. And uh, so I, I had things I was researching on, like reincarnation, like karma, and why people suffer. And I wasn't getting answer in the Bible. And I just realized that going again through that process of using the Bible as my base is like waste of time. And I also, and I found that I, I have that kind of uh, mood most of the time when I see something like it's a very clear, uh, clear subject. I mean, it's very clear to me. And then uh, there's so much argument uh, opposing that. I found it very time wasting trying to go deeper and trying to see what is the opposing argument. It's like waste of time. I would rather try to find out more about what has convinced me or what my conviction is about. That does not mean not being open-minded, but I'm just saying that, isn't it waste of time? For instance, like a devotee trying to, to find out more about spirituality, excuse me to say, in, in other groups, after having all these medical issues, Fantastic. Okay, uh, I got your question. Science. Yes, it's yeah, a good so point. Can you explain? Right. Okay, and thank you. Correct. See, there uh, there is a the question is that normally if we want to study to reinforce our understanding, our conceptions, what's wrong? If I if I study reincarnation, and then I am studying the Bible. If I want to share about the wisdom of reincarnation, I study the Bible primarily to find out verses which support reincarnation over there. And I have done that also when I was reading a book, I wrote a book on reincarnation, demystifying reincarnation. So is there anything wrong in that? No, there's a difference between uh, purposefulness. Purposefulness is essential for us in anything that we do. Now, in some way, somebody might say that purposefulness is a kind of blindness. What do I mean by that? Like even a horse is racing, often they put blinders around the horse. Let it not see anything else. Now, is that a bad thing? No, it's not necessarily a bad thing. That's how the horse can focus, avoid getting distracted. So to some extent, when we are purposeful about something, we do have to put everything else in the background. The world is too complicated for us to take in all possible information from all possible sources. We have, to, we have to select what am I going to focus on. And if I have a particular purpose, say I'm studying a particular subject, then if, I go, if we go to university, there'll be hundreds of books over there. So see, if there is an interest and we pursue that interest, that's purposeful. But there is, what, what I was talking about is especially a negative conception about someone or somebody. Hmm? So, for example, if somebody believes that a particular sacred text or a particular text of a particular book, particular teacher is a, is a book that teaches violence, then what happens is, then they will only look in that text for all the, te in that book for all the verses that talk about violence. Now, is that the primary teaching of that book? Is that how its original adherents, its, its followers see that text? No. So, so, see, there is the purpose of learning on a particular subject and expanding our knowledge. That purpose is perfectly fine. That's, that's how we can function. Without a purpose, we will not be able to function at all. But when I'm talking about bias, when I'm talking about prejudices, what we are doing is we are not actually trying to learn the subject. We are, it's like, 
I already know the conclusion, and now I only want to reinforce the conclusion. Now, is that wrong? We may say, okay, I know that the soul exists. I know reincarnation is true. I am not interested in the Bible per se. I am interested in reincarnation. Okay, that's fine. If that's what we are interested, in, then that's fine. But do, then don't claim to be a Bible scholar. It is all a matter of what we are claiming to be. I may have references from the Bible for supporting reincarnation, but that doesn't make me a Bible scholar. I may say that the Bible also teaches reincarnation. Now you have to do some extrapolation to get that conclusion. Not all, not too difficult, but it's 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 not straightforward. It's possible, but that, but to claim that that is what the Bible teaches, there's a different thing. So purposefulness is a kind of blindness, but it is directed towards a particular end. But when we are biased. what happens is we make claims beyond our field of expertise beyond our area of knowledge so yes if somebody says i have a particular uh, you know i have experienced i have this kind of experience in this community or i have this kind of experience in that community that is fine you know, that's your experience nobody is countering that nobody can challenge that but if from that somebody concludes that this entire community is like that well that is where bias comes in so yes when we as put the proposing that when we make claims but human limitation that is there in one sense we can never go beyond human limitations it is the question is what claim are we making the claim matters so the search for knowledge is also a matter of focus we always have to focus to learn something but are we claiming knowledge of something beyond our particular specialization so to, to put this i'll conclude this with one one simple point that purposefulness centers on learning uh, focusing our attention on learning about a particular subject in contrast when we talk about knowledge in the mode of ignorance it focuses more on pursuing a particular agenda quite often which is destructive which is nihilistic which is toxic so it's it's a person knowledge mode of goodness can be purposeful and they will learn something new and a person in the mode of ignorance when they pursue what they what they seek to learn that will only harm others and harm themselves okay yes i saw a couple of hands raised uh, mr vendor your time sahadev prabhu Mr. Mitra Bindra, sorry, Prabhu. Mitra Bindra, Prabhu, uh, shoes. Okay. Uh, hi, Krishna. Um, thank you so much for your um, input and insight. Um, my uh, comment is on again this aspect of bias, and um, you know it can be relatable to one's experiences or traumas of the negative kind, and. Uh, in a sense um slathering or painting that experience on everything or everyone you see relatable to that trauma or that experience uh i wanted to ask the question um about how in the aspect of not respecting honoring or understanding differences biases take over intelligence community and in some aspects for those who are not um understanding dharma would you please relate okay so see what happens is if we consider on the perspective of the three modes there are always people who are mm, there will always be people who are in some mode it said that in some mode or the other a few will be in the mode of goodness many will be in the mode of passion and quite a few will be in the mode of ignorance so when extremism spreads in society broadly how does this happen you can see this diagram let me make it full screen now see basically tamas is the mode of ignorance so people may have many exclusivist ideologies exclusivist means say my way is the only way or something like that so but from there sorry sorry where did it go yeah mm 
yeah so if there are followers in tamas tamas is the mode of ignorance and there are leaders in tamas leaders are also in the mode of ignorance that is the worst case scenario that is where that particular community state country can turn into hell and bring hell on others mm -hmm. there will always be people in the mode of ignorance anywhere in the leadership community in the followers community but if the leaders become those leaders become prominent and their followers also in tamas so this is where uh, horrendous events can happen so we can have ethnic cleansing we can have genocide and all these kind of things so ideal situation is where neither the followers nor the leaders are in the mode of ignorance uh, so if they are in goodness that is the best if they are in transcendence even even greater but even if they are in passion at least they will not be a indiscriminate discrimination indiscriminate discret indiscriminate destructiveness so what happens is that in the mode of if they are in rajas or sattva in their passion or goodness if both of them are there that is the best if the followers are in the mode of ignorance but at least the leaders are not in the mode of ignorance the followers are in the mode of ignorance but leaders are not then what happens is the followers may want to do violent things but the leaders will calm them down no don't do this the leaders may have their own the followers may have their own biases but the leaders will give a balancing perspective mm -hmm. now sometimes the followers may be may be good people may be decent people but the leaders may be in ignorance and then they will poison their followers this is what can happen so this is this is bad but this is worse because leaders are people who influence krishna says yadya acharati shreshta satta deve itaro jana that as leaders are people emulate them people follow them so when does when do biases biases will always be there because they are characters of the mode of ignorance but the question is who has biases and how influential those people are so if it is a leader who has heavy biases against somebody a leader will have a lot of influence on others and a leader also the leader is influential and the leader attracts a influential number of followers also then that is terrible so in general going back to the earlier question about uh, uh, about the war in russia and ukraine so we have to find out somehow or the other we need to be able to raise human consciousness or connect with people who are in raised human consciousness if there are some people in sattva there are some people who are moderate you no know, can they raise their voice can they be of influence and can they counter it so in general the counter for extremism is not further extremism the mode of ignorance cannot be countered by the mode of ignorance that will only double compound ignorance so even when we say a oh, particular community is extremist but even within that community even within that country even in that particular group we find somewhere people who are in some people who are in goodness some people who are in rajas and their consciousness slightly risen and from there we grow from so we empower them we encourage them so they need to be internally empowered they need to be externally empowered that's when these biases can be countered otherwise it's toxic otherwise it will it will become very destructive Does thank you so question? much for real i mean i'm sorry i had to leave momentarily i'm at my son's baseball game um i i loved your answers because they're you know they're based in um helping and understanding uh the aspect of leadership so so what i what i wanted to say is um so inherently these aspects of health and leadership are so important but often overlooked um you know i know that in terms of uh a leader of a country they have to have a physical before they are uh able to actually take that office or position so these aspects of internal health based on the soul the consciousness healing traumas you know in one's life which we all have um are actually beneficial to leading um but not often often overlooked for the sake of getting things done uh how can we um you know as a community but also reflectively because krishna consciousness is so wonderful how can we share exemplary in an exemplary way these aspects of healing 
emotionally, physically, psychologically, um, spiritually, in order to guide communities and uh, in a non-sectarian way, share and care for other communities and ways of practicing God consciousness that will just lead to more cohesiveness. Yes, it's a tough question. I brought it two things. See, what happens is, especially because we are in the bhakti tradition, our vision of transcendence is very specific. And many people equate specificity with sectarianism. What I mean is that, oh, you worship one particular God, you worship Krishna. Oh, Krishna is the God worshipped by this particular group of people. So they don't see that as universal. Of course, if they understand the philosophy of the Gita, they will say that actually Krishna is a universal deity. But at least initially, people equate specificity with sectarianism. So if we are going to reach out to people who are outside our community, it is much easier to do that on the platform of goodness than on the platform of transcendence. If we focus on transcendence too much, then it's very difficult for people to connect with us. Okay, this is your belief, this is your teaching, this is your practice. What has this got to do with me? So for example, we may talk about chanting. What is the purpose of chanting? Uh, if you tell them to develop love for Krishna, well, you know, who is Krishna and why, do I, why should I be developing love for him? I was in India, but still, when I was, I was born and brought up in India where Krishna is, I knew Krishna from my childhood. But even then, when I heard the name is Khan first, my first question was, you know, okay, what is this Krishna consciousness? And why do you need an international society for that? So, of course, I got the answer and realized how important it is. But for people who, are, what is the purpose of chanting? You know, we can say that it is to raise human consciousness, to make us more self-aware, to make us more aware of our surroundings. So even we may not use the word sattva guna, mode of goodness, but we can describe the characteristics of the mode of goodness. It can make us more introspective. It can help us control our, uh, regulate our impulses. You know, it can help us become more resourceful in terms of tapping our inner resources better, not letting our emotions and our urges carry us away. So we can phrase this in universal terms. So in, in we see there is a journey of consciousness all the way from the mode of ignorance up to transcendence. So what happens is everybody is on that journey of consciousness. Now not very few understand that the destination is Krishna and they may not be able to relate with Krishna at all. But that doesn't mean they're not on the journey of consciousness. So if we can understand this feature that everybody's on the journey of consciousness and see uh, what will take them one step forward from where they are, which part of our wisdom can they connect with? So outreach is not just like a, a matter of downloading a particular verse or a particular point. Outreach is more about considering where this person is and helping them take a step forward. That's why in uh, out, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that in 326, He says, don't disturb people's minds by giving them advice or instruction which is beyond their capacity to process. So that's why we need to understand what is their level and give guidance accordingly. When Srila Prabhupada met George Harrison, at that time, uh, George, George Harrison had that unspoken pressure because everybody was moving into the temple. Hare Krishna, at that time, Hare Krishna devotees means moving into the temple. The idea was, if you are living in the temple, you are transcendental. If you are living outside the temple, near the temple, you are in goodness. If you are living far away from the temple, you are in passion. Being very far away from the temple, you are in ignorance. So the transcendental was reduced to the geographical. So they felt that pressure. When, when Prabhupada met George Harrison and George Harrison asked this, Prabhupada said, no, there's no need for you to do that at all. Now, whatever you are doing, you, you are singing, making songs, make songs about Krishna. So Prabhupada saw his level. And further also, I could go further into this, one more point I'll conclude. You know, there is this uh, conversation which comes in Chant Hare, Chant, Chant Hare Krishna and Be Happy of Prabhupada and George Harrison. But that is an abridged conversation. There is a much more elaborate conversation which comes in Veda base. 
So what happens is George Harrison started writing songs about God and Krishna, and what happened was his popularity started going down severely because that's not what plot, that's not what people expected, and all the popular pop critics and fans started saying, "Oh, you know, now his uh, his star has set." and it has happened because he has hung up, he has got mixed up with this spiritual crowd is hari krishna crowd so george harrison told prabhu pad he met him and says swami ji for every one person i am getting to krishna it seems i am pushing 10 people away from krishna what should i do so he had an earnest desire to talk about krishna but prabhu pad said use your intelligence to do things in an effective way so then what he did was he started mixing up his songs he started writing songs like he was writing earlier and then he would discreetly bring in a little bit about spirituality about krishna and his popularity rose again so the point i'm making is that instructions have to be given in a way that are recept are suitable for that person to rise otherwise they will say oh just stop all your mundane songs and sing about krishna well okay but is that that might bring a few people to krishna and that might take a million people away from krishna you know if imagine there's some big in america it's baseball in india it's cricket some big baseball star or cricket star becomes uh, becomes a devotee and in a key match that person plays poorly and their team loses and they lose the championship and at the end the interviewer asks what happened and at that time this this sports star says you know ultimately this world is temporary and miserable Just chant Hare Krishna and be happy. Now, chant Hare Krishna and be happy is a wonderful message, but to speak it at that time is dreadful. I mean, you cannot imagine any worse form of anti-preaching than that. So, chant Hare Krishna and happy, which is essential preaching message, can be the worst anti-preaching message, because at that time, a person, that person who is a sports player, is expected to be a sports player. and if that person has not done well then that's that has to be addressed so that's why outreach has to be done very sensitively considering what is the need of the person at that point what will help that person come a step forward from where they are okay thank you yes sir dev prabhu hi krishna thank you so much for being here uh it's always a so good to hear from you uh very good my My, I have two questions. The first one is a really quick one. Uh, is there a way one can reach out to you for like philosophical uh, help? Like if someone needs philosophical uh, clarifications, uh, if that is possible. I am your YouTube subscriber, so I don't know if there is a possibility to uh, reach out to you for help in that way. Uh, my second question. I'm sorry to like deviate us from the theme a little bit because we we were discussing uh, from the Shrimad Bhagavat, and we came across something Shrimad had said, which was kind of confusing to me. So I'm wondering if you would be kind enough to help explain it to me. It's in the prefab uh, to Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto One, Chapter Fourteen, Text Eight. If you can look it up, One Fourteen. Okay, just can you repeat once again? Which one is it? One Fourteen Eight. Okay, let's open. It. Yeah. Yeah, get it to the lower part of the prefab. It's kind of lengthy prefab. Uh, Sri Prabhupada was talking about how Lord Krishna was shot and how he left his body, and it was it was surprising to me what Sri Prabhupada said. Starting from uh, therefore, like if you go below the Virat Rupa. Will, Therefore, it should be understood that Lord, when Lord Krishna was okay. apparently killed, okay. the Lord Therefore, left his soul, material body in the material world. Okay. Therefore, his 
Therefore, there's one sort of body or acceptance that body does not mean that is. Let me say it. Therefore, it should be understood that when Lord Krishna was apparently killed by the bow and arrow of the hunter, the Lord mm -hmm. left his so-called material body in the material world. Uh, if you can help. Okay. That so the context is, yeah, it's a, the context is, if you see the verse, what is going on is, um, they're discussing whether the Lord is departing from the world. The Pandavas are discussing, uh, the Pandavas are deliberating. So Prabhupada is talking about how at one level, he says, there is no difference between the Lord's self and the Lord's transcendental body. This is one thing he says very clearly. Yeah. But then Prabhupada qualifies that the Virata Rupa of Lord Krishna is also different from him by his inconceivable position. The Virata Rupa is the universal form. So Prabhupada makes it clear that the universal form is not actually spiritual. At one level, we can say everything connected with the Lord is spiritual. But that's more of a, uh, a realized way of looking at things. It's not the, it's more of a vision rather than a, it's a more, a, how should I put it? It's more a, a a way of a, re a realized soul's way of looking at reality than the actual reality. Just like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he was traveling from India, from South India to Vrindavan, he saw every forest to be Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. He saw every hill to be Govardhan. But the key thing is, he didn't stop there. Oh, this is Vrindavan, let me stop over here. He kept moving toward what was the actual Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. So, to see everything as spiritual is actually a indication of the high level of consciousness. But that does not mean it is actually, it does, that does not mean every tree, every forest was Vrindavan. So the universal form is material. It is, it is the universe of course is material and the form which shows the universe as its parts is also material. So Prabhupada is using that point to say that there is another way a material body was manifested by the Lord. So Jiva Goswami in his commentary explains that the Lord is reciprocal. Krishna also talks about this in the uh, 4.11. I reciprocate with people. So, so what he says is there are some people who want to be deluded about the Lord. They don't want to come to know about his glories they have their demoniac ideas and that's what they want to hold on to. So Krishna reciprocates with their desires and allows them to hold on to it. So, so Krishna sometimes performs pastimes what are called as Asura Mohan Leela. Their pastimes perform specifically to delude the demoniac, demoniac people. So one such past, so, so for example, let's take from a natural perspective. Now we may look at the whole phenomena of rains and how they happen and how land masses way, way far away from the oceans get rain to the clouds. It's a magnificent mechanism. The clouds are like a vast mobile water tank, which is aircraft proof. Now, not even the twin towers were designed with such technology. So it's magnificent. And for a thoughtful person, this indicates some higher level of intelligence that is provided for our need for water. Now, instead of looking at all this evidence, an atheist will say, okay, if rains, if clouds were arranged so that we humans could get water, then why does it rain on the oceans? Well, the answer is so that atheists can ask questions like this and stay atheistic. The point is that if somebody wants to be atheistic, see there is there is enough reason in this world for someone to be atheistic if that's what they want. So similarly, with respect to Krishna also, see, if somebody wants to believe that Krishna was not God, Krishna was an ordinary person, Krishna will leave evidence like that for them also. The Bhagavatam states that Krishna actually went to the abode of death. And he went and he didn't die, leave alone dying. He actually went to the abode of death and came back from there. And came back from there and brought somebody who was dead back from there. 
So if somebody who could go to the abode of death and bring somebody back, so how would that person die just by an arrow of a bow? And that arrow also did not actually hit a, a later vital part of the body. The arrow hit a foot, hit, hit the leg. So actually for somebody who is demoniac and they want to not believe in the Lord's pastimes, the Lord leaves some evidence for them. So Krishna's leaving a material body is like that. So if this like, if what evidence do we want to look at? If that is the evidence you want to look at and ignore all other evidence, then okay, can reinforce your beliefs that Krishna is an ordinary person. So when Prabhupada is saying, therefore, he's actually giving an explanation. Just as this is a material, this is the material form of the Lord, the universal form. Similarly, here's another material form of the Lord. That is uh, the form which he left behind. I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much, Prabhupada. It's so beautiful. Very, very understanding. Thank you. Thank you. My other question was... And, you yeah, and regarding your first point, you know, I'm happy to be of service. I, I have two websites. Okay. The spiritual scientist.com and guitarily.com. If you leave any comments there, okay. I I usually try to respond to the comments there. Okay, thank you so much. I'm just sending the links over here. Okay, please do. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Yes, do we have any other? Jack? Hi, Krishna. Please accept my obeisances. All glories to Guru and Garanga. Thank you for a very um, insightful and uh, class with practical applications. Uh, so when you when you first began uh, 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 telling the story about the king and his son that was a monster, um, I and you were describing it. I was relating it to you know in the material world. Uh, sometimes someone with those kinds of of characteristics are re referred to as a, uh, a sociopath. And, you know, sometimes you see children, um, very young children who are um, like monsters, you know, in the material world and who are apt to hurt small animals or other children. And with the children being our future, how can you, how can we help children like that when we recognize those kind, that kind of behavior, you know, so that they don't grow up to be, you know, um, notorious leaders or, or infamous people like a Bonnie and Clyde, you know, in our society? Yeah. How do we help yeah. them? You know, okay. even though, and I, I just wanted to say, you know, there's one school of thought that, okay, they're born like that. That's who they are and they can't be changed. What do you say to that? Well, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about Swabhava, about our nature. And he does make some important points. See, there's one metaphor of say, parenting is like children are like clay. And they're shaped by parents or tablet or so. The children are just like a blank slate. And what are impressions are put on it? Now, our philosophy is slightly different. We understand that every soul is on a multi-life journey of spiritual evolution. So, the soul who has come as a child has a past. And in that sense, we can say children are less like clay and more like seeds. So, now... We cannot get a mango fruit from an apple tree. Hmm? At the same time, just because, sorry, from an apple seed. Now, just because it's an apple seed doesn't mean automatically it's going to get a given apple tree. It, might, it, needs it needs cultivation. It needs care for it to grow. So, yes, it is true that there are different impressions which each soul brings from the past. However, our tradition is quite clear that you know, we are not prisoners of our past. In some ways, we are products of our past, of course. We cannot deny where we have come from. But apart from whatever, whatever karma we bring from our past lives, our upbringing matters, our association matters, 
our spirituality matters, our free will matters. So many things matter. So, so in one sense, yes, if somebody has that kind of indications from childhood, then they may not be able to, if somebody has, uh, we could say a Kshatriya nature. Kshatriya nature means they have a take charge attitude. And sometimes they may, they may seem to be uh, a bit power hungry. Like all kids cry, but some, some, all children cry, but some children, when they cry, it's as if they are bringing the whole house down. Some children right from their crevice, when they're looking out, they're taking a, when am I going to take over the house? So now that's not necessarily a bad thing. If somebody has a high level of energy, a high level of vigor, then that needs to be channeled constructively. So, so quite often, the problem is not necessarily what the impressions the child brings from the past. The problem is the expectations that are imposed on the child. That, you know, oh, if the parent, if somebody is a, of a Kshatriya disposition and they are expected to act Brahmanically, oh, you know, be peaceful, be gentle, be sober. Well, that may not be the who child the child is. So there are two extremes if you consider pendulum. Let me see. I just I was today making this diagram that we, we can't control our nature, but that does not mean we have to be controlled by our nature. You know, we can work with our nature cooperatively. So let's see. Yeah, let me see if I can find this over here. Yeah. See, if you want to understand our nature, so one extreme, so children come with their nature. We all come with our nature. So we are conditioned by it. So one extreme of the pendulum is to think that we are completely controlled by our nature. This is who I am and that's all I can do. I can't do anything more than this. But that is one extreme. The other extreme is to think that we can completely control our nature. That we can change ourselves or in this case, we can change our children and make them completely different from who they are. But what we can do is we can work with our nature. So cooperatively and constructively. This is who I am. And this is how I'm going to work. So that, that requires some careful understanding. So if the parents start imposing their expectations on children, then the children are sooner or later going to rebel. And then their actual nature won't be channeled constructively. It will not it will be like a volcano erupting destructively. So when we say our nature, there are different aspects to it. Just because somebody is aggressive or uh, somebody is uh, somebody is, has a take charge attitude, that's not necessarily a bad thing. They need to be trained, channeled accordingly. So uh, that would be a broad understanding. We have to. It has to be carefully done. See the child like a seed, and the children, parents should be thinking, "Oh, I've got a mango seed. I'm going to get a mango tree." Well, no. You have apple seed. So understand it's apple. And that's what you can expect from the apple. Okay. So I'll try to... Are there any other questions? Or should I try to conclude this pastime? We'll take a few more verses. In last five, seven minutes. Just uh, one comment, Prabhu, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, uh, going back to uh, this is pretty dark. Thank you, uh, yes, Prabhu. Prabhu, yeah. yeah, so uh, just going back to Sadi's um, question uh, regarding the hunter and Krishna and Prabhupada's comment, and of course, Bharat Prabhu also is here today. So I remember very well, you know, in the 80s, late 80s, I mean, late 90s, I mean, 90, around 1988, when I used to just start going to the temple, and, and Bharat Prabhu was my temple president, and he would speak so much. So one time, just coincidentally, you know, you are here today. Chitacharan Prabhu and Sadeb is here and Bara Prabhu is also here. So um Bara Prabhu will speak exclusively about Krishna and talk so many beautiful things. So I'm in doubt. So when I go back to the campus, I'll go back to the library and research this Krishna that he's so eloquently speaking about. So I find out that that Krishna was actually killed by a hunter. I mean, he was shot with an arrow on his feet. So I felt wow. So the goddess folks worship was actually killed by a hunter. So I was prepared for him the next Sunday, I go to their temple to hear him speak. And um, that Sunday, uh, unfortunately for me, he was not speaking, somebody else was speaking. 
and that happened to be Omkara Prabhu. So inside me, I was waiting. Um, I need to ask, you know, these guys, you know, you worship this God, but this God was killed by a hunter. So that is still boiling after Omkara Prabhu asked for questions. I, I had to bring it up because it's very disturbing that they clap so much, but they clap for, you know, the guy that was killed by a hunter. So I brought that question up and Omkara Prabhu, uh, just like you also alluded to today, eloquently spoke and said, well, uh, the Lord fulfilled the desire of everyone. And there are those who actually thought he's an ordinary human beings. And to those personalities, he was actually shot by a hunter. And there are the yogis uh, that are meditating in mountain tops in different locations. They saw a super soul merging into them. And for his devotees who see him as the best of friends and he transcended, rise above. So he said to everybody, they only see him based on their consciousness, just like you alluded to. So it's just coincident that, you know, old age, when you're getting old like me, you want to talk history. So I was just remembering 1998 and my encounter in terms of, you know, you know, seeing that Krishna was actually killed by a hunter and all these guys always clap. So I need to challenge them about that. So thank you, Prabhu, for letting me just, you know, share this. Thank you, Prabhu. I'm happy to have service. But with new people, it's a completely different ball game. My understanding would be that, I, I answer that in the world, because this world is a finite space, it is finite in terms of space and in terms of time. So even when the infinite distance to the world is going to be within the constraints of time and space and more than how a, more than the specific mode in which a person departs, that is important, but more important than that is what, what is the, how did the person live? What does the person teach? So if you see in one sense, the many of, from a, from a material perspective, Many of the stories of the Bhagavatam may seem to end in a tragedy. Parikshit Maharaj, he hears Bhagavatam for seven days, but at the end, what happens? Like, imagine if there's some movie which shows some hero is going to die after seven days. And then there is some kind of adventure and they do all kinds of things. And at the end, the hero dies. So, what is the great, what's so special about it? So, in one sense, the whole Bhagavatam is like a death narrative. Almost all the characters, Dhruva's departure is depart, described, Prutumara's departure will be described. So the Bhagavatam does not uh, like blink its eyes when describing the departure of Krishna. The theme of the Bhagavatam is that whether the departure is auspicious. See, Shukdev Goswami narrates the beautiful story of how Dhruva Maharaj departs. You know, the Vishnu Putas come over there, the Vaikuntha airplane comes and he's visibly seen to depart from the world. And Parishit Maharaj hears that. The Bhagavatam contains that story of a very, a very moral, very faith enhancing departure from the world. But the Bhagavatam's recipient story doesn't seem to be that faith enhancing. He hears the Bhagavatam and at the end of the snake curve, a snake, a snake bird bites, and his body just explodes into flame and he dies. So, the, so in one sense, our tradition says it's very important how one dies. But in other sense, it's not at all important how one dies. Now, what do I mean by that? That what is important is what is one's consciousness at the time of death. And what is not that important is what is this one's circumstance when one dies. As devotees, we all know we are going to die and we would like to depart from the world, maybe surrounded by devotees, maybe in a holy place, hearing the holy names. But that may or may not happen. Sometimes even in our movement, for some very exalted leaders of our movement, sometimes that happened wonderfully, sometimes that didn't happen at all. So with respect to Krishna, it is Krishna's departure in that sense, the Bhagavatam forces us to go to the essentials. If somebody thinks, oh, how a person departs from the world is going to determine their glory. And Krishna's departure seems to be almost anticlimactic. You know, the hero who lifted up mountains, the hero who bested demons who were like 10 times his size, that hero is felled by an arrow hitting his leg. What kind of story is this? So it's not, even from a, even if somebody doesn't accept Krishna to be God, 
just from a story perspective, it seems it's anticlimactic. So the Bhagavatam forces us to go toward the essentials. So in simple terms, my answer would be that yes, what a how a person has lived, what a person has taught, that is much more important in the circumstances in which a person died. So how we depart is more about the consciousness and not so much about the circumstances. Okay. So I think I'm already over time. Should we stop here? Prabhu? Customarily, Prabhu, devotees who wanted to carry on. So we depart into you. Okay. okay so I'll quickly try to complete this pastime. So, or at least the section. So I was making, I was, okay, I'll recap where I came from and then we, where we went off in a different direction. So I started the narrative by talking about how uh, Vena is born, he's a monster. And then his father is deliberating what to do at such a time. So his fa I said that where his father takes a decision which seems, seems very curious. Or put it, it can make someone furious. There's such a monster who is a prince and the father simply decides to renounce the world. And he starts thinking how inauspicious it is for me that I have got such a terrible son. And then his thinking shifts and starts thinking, actually it is auspicious. If I had a good son, I would have become attached. And if I would have become attached, then I would have become entangled in the wood. This terrible son whom I have got is a blessing for me. And therefore, I'll take this blessing and renounce the wood. And he renounces the world, focuses on, focuses on transcendence and progresses towards perfection. So now, this when I read this, okay, my first thought was, this seems so self-centered. He's not thinking about the kingdom. So you're leaving the kingdom in the hands of such a person. What is he going to do? If, if in the presence of the king, the prince can't be controlled, then the prince becomes the king, what is going to happen? So is he not concerned about this? Isn't it his responsibility to be concerned about this? So then I read the Bhagavatam carefully. I read the Acharya's commentaries also. And it is described that in various ways, Anga tried to control Veda. And he just couldn't do it. So there is a time when we have to do, we have to strive to do our responsibilities in the world. And we have to try our best. But there is a time and we need to turn away from the world. We need to renounce the world. So now what will happen to the world? What about my responsibility in the world? Well, the world, we, as they say, the God who took care of the world before we were born and who will take care of the world after we die. He can take care of the world even when we turn away from the world. So we are not in charge of the world. So the Bhagavatam has a particular focus. The Bhagavatam is a universal book. At the same time, it is spoken to a particular person. It is spoken to Parikshit Maharaj. And Shukadev Goswami, the narrator, selects stories in such a way that the focus is on reinforcing Parikshit Maharaj's single-minded conviction to focus on transcendence. Parikshit Maharaj has renounced the world. And because he got the curse that he's going to die in seven days, he's renounced the world. Now at that time, Parikshit Maharaj was still young. So he could have started thinking, is my son prepared? I have handed over the kingdom to Janmeja. Is he ready or not? Will he, not, will he be able to rule? Will he be able to stop the age of Kali? If not, what is going to happen? So, if somebody has made a particular choice, you need to be committed to that choice. So, no second thoughts. Now, that is not the only way of approaching situations. Arjun wanted to renounce the world and Krishna told him, no, you have to engage in the world. You have to do your responsibilities. So, the Lord may call upon different people to serve in different ways at different times. So, in this situation, the key lesson is not, now of course we will see that if Vena is born, he's a terrible king, but from Vena, Prithu will come and he's a glorious king. So in that sense, the, in that sense, Anga's departure, it accelerates the chain of events by which Prithu will appear on the world. So in the long run, auspiciousness reigns. But in this case, the focus is on how Anga processes this event. The king Anga, he's long sought to have a child. He has performed a great sacrifice to get a child. 
and after that when he loses his child or rather his child turns out to be a nightmare for him what does he do he doesn't simply become resentful rather he turns that into something constructive that's why the theme i said the bhagavatam talks about not so much why bad things happen to good people he could have asked this question you know i performed such a great yagya and the yagya was successful why did i have such a terrible child now the bhagavatam talks about some genealogy that is there was some in auspicious connection from his mother's side but this is such a great yagya could it not have countered it could he have done something else to counter it well the cause of suffering is very difficult to determine so he focused not so much on the cause but on the purpose okay i've got a i've got a bad son let me let me take this as an opportunity to detach myself from the world so that's so that is the pragmatism of the bhagavatam the spirit we can say the spiritual pragmatism of the bhagavatam that even when one's most cherished dreams turn into ashes the person doesn't become resentful the person doesn't become hateful the person sees even in that a spiritual opportunity and that's what opportunity he takes so that is the rationale for his decision when he turns and renounces the world okay so that is where the chapter will end and then the next chapter will start describing the further the depredations of vena when he becomes the king and the brahmanas will have to make a mystical intervention stage a mystical intervention to stop him and to bring about the great king prutu thereafter thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna hare krishna prabhu uh, thank you so much for gracing us we are really and really um appreciative of your presence i just want to deliver a message my husband uh, madhvacharya was called away on an emergency to work he was looking forward to being here and you know having your association but he was called away and he apologized thank you so much for gracing us again thank you thank you i'm happy to be of service yeah, i had visited there and it's you have a very special place i look forward to coming there again and i was so delighted to have the opportunity to be of some service thank you, thank you for uh, your very many thoughtful questions and when we speak on the bhagavatam sometimes uh, it can be very transcendental all the questions here very very relevant so i can see that it's a very thoughtful group of serious devotees that is here and i'm grateful for the opportunity of service please convey my pranams to madhacharya prabhu and i pronounce to you also kunti mata ji Hare Hare Krishna. Absolutely. Our request is that you come back again and again, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yes. you for the invitation. Yes. I'm happy to be of service. Yes. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Granthraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki chai. Srila Prabhupada ki chai. Gaur Bhakta Vrind ki chai. Gaur Premanand ki chai. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Happy Thank yourself. you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yes. Thank you so much, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. <laughs> It's such Thank a pleasure you. to hear from you. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Nice to see you. Humble yes, I'm always a pleasure. We have to to have you back more and more often. <laughs> yes, Hare Krishna, Rajila Mata Ji. Also, humble always a pleasure. Good to see you. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. So sorry, I apologize. I had a class, and I came on as soon as I was finished, and I was just so excited to hear you speak. Uh, of course, always. And thank you. I was I was just reflecting on the ultimate compassion of those personalities in the Bhagavatam that helps us to remember that ultimately, uh, in every situation, we need to depend on Krishna, and we need to understand more about our relationship with the Lord. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, humble Vis. Hare Krishna. Humble Vijayshree Prabhupada. Thank you. <laughs>